welcome. Let's grab our songbooks. Let's stand together as we sing Victory in Jesus. We'll sing a couple stands and sing the people in from the back. So good to see you this morning. Happy Father's Day. 812, Victory in Jesus. I heard an old seated senior saints are actually all those of you that are going on the trip tomorrow to Pennsylvania to Lancaster make sure right after the service you meet us up front here right on the piano side it'll be very brief I promise but get up here right after that service so we can talk about some things we'll not announce that as well later preacher all right take your Bibles I'll open them to Luke chapter number one Luke chapter number one and we are in the Amazing time of summertime. Wasn't it just a couple of days ago? It was like 400 degrees outside. And then this morning it, uh, it was nice and uh, almost felt like that they had the air on outside. It was very, very comfortable, very nice outside this morning. Um, but we have a lot of folks that are out there traveling, a lot of folks that are visiting as well. We are studying spiritual gifts. The reason we are studying spiritual gifts is because of the importance of knowing what it is that God has created us to do in the body. Paul tells the church at Corinth to make sure they understand that not everybody can be the eye. If the, if the whole body was seeing, then where was the hearing? And then here in Romans, uh, we're there, not here because we're in Luke chapter 1, but in Romans 12, he gives the, the basic seven different spiritual gifts that we have. And the reason we are teaching this, and we have a number of visitors here this morning, very, very thankful for that. But the reason that we're teaching that is because if you are going to fully enjoy the gift of the Spirit, you're going to do it in the area that He has gifted you to work. In other words, uh, making just a simple illustration, if God made you to be a drill, you're not going to be very fun and uh, not going to have a very good time if you are trying to hammer all of the time. Because I don't know if you've ever, do you know the difference between a drill and a hammer? Okay, you know what I'm talking about there? So if you have to hammer something and all you have is a drill and you try to do it, how many of you have tried to hammer something without a hammer? Come on, be honest. Now, you can sometimes get it in, right? Uh, and you can, you can sometimes get whatever you're hammering in with the, I have actually tried to hammer with my drill. Do you know why? Because I didn't have a hammer. And I thought, well, I'll just turn around and my drill has this nice, really heavy battery on the bottom of it that you don't have to worry about puncturing or anything. I mean, it's just this nice, flat surface. And I don't have to drive it that deep. I just have to drive it a little bit anyway. So that's, not, that's really not what it's designed for. And so if you don't realize what you are designed to do and you are running about just doing what different programs and different things the church has designed, that is not going to be a very fruitful or enjoyable time for you. Uh, a drill enjoys drilling. It's made to drill. It gets lots accomplished when it's drilling. Uh, but when it is, uh, say, 
mixing batter, it's not quite as uh, enjoyable in doing that. There are other things for that. And so let me encourage you, if uh, you're only here for today, let me encourage you, you can get online, look at our study of spiritual gifts, and I would encourage you to do that. We are in our spiritual gifts booklet. Do we have some more of those out back? We, we may have some folks that need. We do have some, Brother Pate has some. If you need one, is there anyone that needs one? Did you raise your hand? Anyone need a spiritual gift booklet? Looking around. We have some on this side over here, Brother Matt, and, a, and, and one over there. And we'll, we'll get these. We are on page 13. We're talking about the teacher. We're in Luke chapter 1. Are you in Luke 1? Now, the two teachers that we were talking about, you know what? Let's have a word of prayer. And then we'll commence to begin. Do you need a spiritual gifts booklet? Hold your hand up and we'll bring you a copy of said booklet. Right over here, Brother Matt. He waited till you looked the other way. There he is. <laughs> Making you earn your money this morning, Brother Johnson. Anyone else? All right, well, let's have a word of prayer and then we'll get started. Lord, thank you for this chance to get together today to study your word. I ask that it would be profitable. I ask that you would fill both speaker and hearer with your spirit. Lord, that your word would go forth powerfully. Lord, that we would understand and be encouraged, those that are teachers here in this room. Uh, Lord, those that have that gift, that they would be further equipped and further sharpened in the ministry that you've given them. And Lord, that it would be a blessing. And if we get into exhortation, I uh, pray the same uh, for that as well. I just ask that you give us understanding, discernment. Lord, fill me with your spirit. Give me your strength. I love you. In Christ's name, amen. We talked about two people in the Bible that display the gifts of being a teacher. And you have two individuals, you have Ezra and you have Luke. Now, if you look at the life of Ezra, Ezra had a very, very important speaking job. But not only was he a speaker, but he organized lots of people to teach. When Nehemiah went back, rebuilt the wall, and Ezra, it wasn't just Ezra that taught all of the thousands of people that was there. That would be incredible if Ezra was just going to stand up and address um, tens of thousands of people by himself, but he actually had different courses of Levites that helped him in that activity. But he is the one that organized it, got it all together. Have you ever been frustrated in your reading of the, maybe you were trying to read through the Bible and you got to Chronicles when it was like 11 chapters of so-and-so begat so-and-so? And you thought to yourself, why in the Ezra teacher wanted the detail down there? Now, Luke is also a teacher, but Luke is not a speaker. Now, when you ask people who wrote or who the disciples are, most of the time, people just not thinking will give you the Gospels. Oh, the disciples, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, uh, Peter. <laughs> and Luke and Mark were not disciples. You need to understand as you read the book of Luke and realize that Luke was not an eyewitness as far as walking around with Jesus Christ all the time. He was interviewing eyewitnesses and he put this treatise together. Let's read it, Luke 1. Luke says through the Holy Spirit, For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, it seemed good to me also having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. And I would again reiterate that the teacher is going to collect truth, is going to research truth, is going to organize truth. And most often the teachers, your good writers are good they are spirit gifted teachers. Now there are some individuals, I know there are some very, very popular uh, preachers out there that are also good teachers. You don't, you don't have to be a teacher to be a preacher, but I have found that most of the teachers that have an extended Bible teaching ministry, in other words, folks uh, subscribe to their books and their Bible studies and all those things, many of them display the gifts of teaching. And so let's look at some of these gifts. We looked already at the idea of the, uh, the different offices. So let's just get into it, recognizing the spirit-filled teacher, okay? So there's a strong desire to validate truth. And, and what I mean by a strong desire to validate truth is they will not just accept something that someone who's not a teacher will just say, well, yes, everybody knows that. A teacher will be driven. If somebody stands up and says, listen, God is love, they're going to validate that. They're going to have a desire to go in and come up with many different verses and, and, and many different stories from God's Word to validate that statement, whereas folks that aren't a teacher are just probably going to go, well, yes, everybody knows that. Next point, please. Teacher is going to want to validate, not just accept. There's going to be a strong desire to collect and assemble truth. 
putting it together. Often enjoy the research more than the teaching. Often enjoy finding out what the reality is, what the truth is, and what backs it up. And there's very, very often a very systematic dissemination. And there's always a strong desire to be thorough, and you see that in Luke's gospel. There are so many things from Luke's gospel that have been used to validate the, the scriptures because there are many things that were written down as far as historically they were only written down in Luke as far as the different names of different political positions. Luke wrote them down, and for a long time, some people said, well, we've never even heard of this outside of this. is obviously something that Luke made up, and then they found out Luke didn't make it up. Luke just researched it well. Even in Acts, when he was writing something down, something that if you're not a teacher, you would not even stop to think about, but when the, when the um, you know what I'm talking about? What am I talking about? <laughs> the brain is shorting out on me. Paul's shipwreck. Remember Paul's shipwreck, Acts 28. Paul's shipwreck, remember they're getting ready to go, and Luke wrote, so they cut loose the rudders and let it run. Until just probably about 50 years ago, that was marked as a mistake in God's word. Because how many rudders does a boat have? One. Everybody knows that. And that was a common thing that was laid out there. There's an obvious thing. Holy Spirit could not have been, uh, you know, giving anybody truth because a, a boat does not have rudders. And then about 50 years ago, they found a boat filled with amphorae, the big, gigantic, large clay pots that things would have been transported in, that had been sunk in the Mediterranean Sea. And guess what it had on the back of the boat? Two rudders that were designed to work in chorus. And they found that and went, hmm. But see, there was no other place. There was no other place in history that it delineated at that point in time that they actually had two rudders on each side of the ship that turned together. And so when Luke wrote that, Luke, being careful, he didn't just say, so they cut loose the rudder. There were two rudders, so it made sense to him to say they cut loose the rudders. And you say, well, that's not a big deal. It became a very big deal about 1,900 years later. And archaeological-wise, when he was writing some things, in fact, some of the names, those genealogies and some of the detailed names that you have read and gone, why are those in there? But every time one of those are dug up in Israel and they are pointed out, it is amazing how, how quickly folks will brush it under the carpet and say, well, you know, that's no big deal. And they're, they're so used to finding names now, it no longer even makes the front page. And when you find names that were nowhere else but in the Bible talking about the keeper of the king's horses and the different things like that when it pops out, it popped out because Ezra and Luke were the kind of folks that were very, very detailed in laying those things out. Now, if you're not a detailed person, teacher is going to aggravate you. In fact, the next spiritual gift we're going to look at because exhorters are not detailed as much on the truth. Exhorters want to run to the application. If you've ever heard a preacher say, wow, that's good truth. I got to find me a Bible verse to back that up. Probably an exhorter, not a teacher. Excellent. Someone wants to give their opinion as to what is going on. See, the, the idea of, of a teacher absolutely being so detailed, if you are not detail-oriented, you tend to lose interest very quickly if a teacher is not careful to recognize that, okay? So you have a, a lot of things like that. Strong distrust unless sources are proven eyewitnesses. Proven eyewitnesses. Not just an eyewitness, not just one eyewitness that says it, but proven and gone to and, and, and looked at over and over and over. Strong loyalty to their teachers or mentors. It's interesting, toward the end of Paul's life, Paul was an exhorter. We'll talk about him a little bit more and if we get a chance to get to that one this morning. Paul was an exhorter. He was working with folks all of the time. He was mentoring people and training people. And Luke is the one that Paul, toward the end of his life, says, only Luke is with me. Luke, Luke was not willing to leave Paul. And he was very, very strong, very, very loyal to his, to his mentor. Uh, a desire to clear confusion and correct error. They, they won't... Some people will say, well, you know what? This person said to take a right. This person said to take four lefts or three lefts, which is a right. And says, well, as long as you're taking three lefts, they're going to get to the same. A teacher's not going to be, teacher's not going to be happy with three lefts. If they're supposed to take a right, they're going to show them, no, it needs to be a right. It can't be three lefts. And the exhorter may look at them and go, listen, three lefts and one right is going to make the same thing. Teacher is not going to abide that. Say, no, no, it needs to be done correctly. And it's very, very important. And they're very, very uncomfortable with subjective material. And when you are 
when you're not spirit filled as a teacher and you're not spirit filled as a prophet, prophets and teachers can, can, they can have a knockdown drag out because a, a prophet will see the error in the, but will not get specific in the error and delineate it from scripture. And the teacher will resist and will say, no, I'm not willing to call that error. And the prophet will go, oh, I can't believe you're not willing to, well, what kind of heretic pagan are you? And, and they can get going after each other because the one is so detail-oriented, it's, he's not willing or she's not willing to say, okay, let me hear the argument. They're just, well, wait, that's subjective. So we can't, we can't call that truth, okay? Another thing, a teacher will really aggravate a mercy because a, a mercy will come up and will say, oh, I'm so burdened for so-and-so because they're going through this. But the teacher will not accept that as truth. It will have to fact check the eye and, and, and t- talk with eyewitnesses. And so the mercy will come up and go, we really need to do this because this person is suffering that. And the teacher will look at them and go, well, we don't really know that. And then the mercy will lose their compassion and want to choke out the life of the teacher at that point in time. Because they were there with the person, they felt the pain, they knew what they were going through. How dare you tell me? And the teacher's going to go, well, we don't know that. We don't know that. We, we, can't, we can't move on, on secondhand or thirdhand information. We've got we, we've to go to the source. And so there's, there's lots of different things that this can cause issues with other spiritual gifts. Okay? They tend to hold on to opinions until full truth is clear. Here is, this is where a teacher, and and this is the positive side of things, but it can be negative. And I realize that I'm not giving them all positive at once and all negative at once. But a teacher, a teacher will listen to everybody's arguments. And then when everybody settles and they say, and this has happened in deacons meetings, this has happened in teachers meetings, this has probably happened in your family. The entire family will talk and they will discuss and they'll go this, this, this. And the teacher will sit there and will ponder. And they will ponder. And then the entire group will go, okay, it looks like this is the best way to go then. And then the teacher will go, <clears throat> um, what about, and that just does not go well sometimes. Because the teacher will, will hold on to their opinions because they want to see where everybody is coming to. They, want, they, they, they like to hold on to things. They don't like to jump in. Um, they, they're upset when scripture is not contextualized. So if somebody gets up and teaches the truth of something but does not give this context of Scripture, that's going to upset a a, a teacher. Now, if it's taken out of context, they'll probably leave the room. I I had a a friend of mine in college. When we went to college back in the day, okay, back before all the Christian colleges went liberal, you're right, all you old people that went to, to Christian colleges and remember the olden days, I can remember one of the teachers that, that was in the Bible program, the college that I went to, uh, a preacher got up and said, we're going to talk, I'm going to tell you today who the Antichrist is. And that teacher stood up and walked out of the church service because the teacher said, there's no point. The Bible doesn't tell us who the Antichrist is. He's not going to waste the next hour and a half of my, and I thought, wow, that's bold. <laughs> I thought, man, I, I never would have pulled it. You didn't, you didn't do that, Pensacola. You just didn't get up and walk out, especially in front of thousands of people. Well, you know, I'm done with this. But, but a teacher, if it's taken out of context, is, is, they're not going to abide it. They're not going to put up with it. And it's, it's very, very simple with them. If it's not contextualized, it's, it's not worthwhile. Believes Bible study to be foundational for all gifts. In other words, if you're trying to figure out how to be a better mercy, how to be a better server, how to be a, anything that you're doing, you need to start in God's word. It's always, 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 always doctrine because that is the that's the guiding idea of the, of the teacher. Find out what the doctrine is, move from there. Next one, tends to look to scriptural principles for problem solving. In other words, they will, a teacher will have a high degree. If you come and ask them a question, they will try to see which biblical principle or which biblical situation this most, or most speaks to this particular question, and then they will answer it according to what they see happening in Scripture. Very, very quick to contextualize things with their children. With their, it doesn't matter. They, they go to Scripture and say, okay, what is, what is happening here? And then believes the exposure to truth will solve all problems. They think that disobedience is because they don't know truth. And that's a big problem with teachers. Teachers many times do not realize that people sometimes know the truth but don't want to do the truth. How many of you know that? Let me ask it a different way. How many of you are parents? Children know the truth, but there's many times they don't want to do the truth, right? But to a teacher, that doesn't make sense. Because a teacher is like, well, the only reason that you wouldn't do it is because you didn't know it. Well, once you know it, once you've been exposed to it, that fixes everything. So what, what, what does that mean? Well, here's the problem. Here's why it's so neat to have the exhorter. Because the teacher will come in 
and will lay out the doctrinal foundation and the purpose for doing something. And then the exhorter being filled in the spirit will say, hey, you see all that good meat right there? Here's how to put it into work. But if the teacher is not careful, just operate on their own, they will just say, here's all of this information. And you will think, have you ever, have you ever gotten to the end of a message and thought, what, what do we do? What was the point of that? We just, we just were in here for, you look at your watch, you felt like it was four hours because it was a teacher not really gifted in speaking. You look down, it's been 20 minutes and you think, whoa. What did, we just, what did we just talk about? And you will see teachers. Teachers will many times get um, distracted by trying to prove different things and trying to, trying to prove what the Bible does not take the time to delineate. What am I talking about? Um, okay, uh, Jimmy DeYoung has a lot of teaching in him. Okay, he's in heaven now. But Jimmy DeYoung, it, it, those of you that came here, listen to him. Did Jimmy DeYoung have like just kind of personal opinions that were no big deal? Or did he believe something? If you didn't believe it, you were probably an idiot. I love him. I'm not being unkind, but that's the way he was like, well, if you think that, then you just haven't studied the Bible. <laughs> that was a response he gave to me as the pastor of a church at a question that I asked in one of the questions. Well, if you think that, you obviously haven't studied the Bible. Yes, that's right. And that's why I invited you to my church, Jimmy. Thank you so much. <laughs> Please tell everybody else everything else that I have not done. with. But he would just lay it out and say, here's, 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 Here's the reality. Well, the application of it is so, so very important. And many times teachers will leave that off. And so the teachers have to be careful to make sure and stop. If you're a parent, that's a teacher. You have to realize just exposing your children to truth is not enough. You, you, have, to, you have to carry it further than that. You have to understand some of those things that are, that are true about you. Now, let's look at the carnal teacher and see if we can get through this. May emphasize credentials. The, a carnal teacher sometimes will think that if... If you are a gifted teacher, but you are not a credentialed teacher, then, then you have not yet been accepted. You, you haven't arrived. So if you don't have enough initials, and, and the thing is, it's not just initials behind their name. It really is different credentials for different folks. In some circles, the credentials are um, recommendations by certain people. Well, if you're recommended by that person, well, then okay, that's the credential. To other people, it's actually the number of letters behind your name. You have to have a certain number of, you know, PhD, DD, DDS, whatever. <laughs> no, that's a doctor of dentistry, I think. I don't know. But the reality is, is that the carnal teacher will not, will not say, hey, let's look at the Bible. They will look at credentials. Um, may require strictness on others before trusting or approving their work. In other words... They will, Pastor Kelly, not just Pastor Kelly, many, my pastor growing up used to say the same thing, eat the meat, spit out the bones. When I use that, what am I saying? Not everybody you read are you going to be able to agree with everything. Not every person are you going to be able to agree with everything, but you can learn truth wherever truth is. Learn to eat the meat and spit out the bones. Don't choke on the bone. Teachers tend to choke on the bone. They tend to throw out the baby with the bathwater. I know I'm switching my... Um, pictures here, but that is, that is what a carnal teacher will do. will say, well, no, no, you're, you're not, mm -mm. And because you're not true in this point, you can't be true in any of these points. And then a teacher that's carnal filled that comes across a mercy who reads something by somebody who is a heretic, but they, they actually kind of recognize what that person is saying is true, they will say, well, this person said this, and the teacher will tend to transport them, well, they're a heretic, you think it's good, you're a heretic as well. <laughs> they, will just, they, they will just kind of superimpose secondary and, and third dairy um, separation, often is very, very important to a teacher. Um, may neglect practical application of truth, we just talked about that. May outright reject others' viewpoints if considered unqualified, and so they will not take time to listen and look at it and go, okay, but if they are qualified, then they will listen to them. So somebody talking to them that doesn't have a degree or doesn't have, they, they don't think a carnal, a carnal teacher will not think that a Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit can speak through them unless they are credentialed and they have the, um, the qualifications. May become prideful in their acquired knowledge. Uh, some teachers, I have been with some teachers that they are so incredibly smart. They, they just made me feel like I had not even learned the English language. 
and, they, and I'm talking to them like, well, David, let's, let's talk about some things in ministry here. So, well, David, you know what, you know what Jeremiah 27, 13 says, right? We all know that. And I'm sitting there. I know what Jeremiah 33, 3, because I can sing that song, call unto me, but I don't know Jeremiah 27, 13. And the first time I said, I, I, I can't really remember. And it got to the point where I went, no, I don't know it. I don't know Bible. I just... I'm, I'm, a, I'm a fraud. Just tell me what it says. Because they will lay out and will, and will say things and go, well, you knew that, right? I mean, right? Because the, the exhorter has the ability to encourage the person to learn how to do it. The teacher, the carnal filled or, or the carnal controlled teacher will make the person feel like giving up. You're, you're never, you're never going to get this down. Um, they sometimes become discouraged and others lack of interest in the details. They will, you know, be blown away that they don't care as much. Some of the, some of the teachers that have written about, about oh man, the, the different textual criticism and things that I have learned from them have been so fabulous, but they just will eviscerate somebody who does not agree with one small little point on one particular thing uh, because they, they tend to throw that baby out with the bathwater. Um, they may become unable to move on faith if facts don't concur. And so if they've studied, if they've looked at it, if they can't come up with enough facts, a carnal controlled teacher will be frozen by the inability to prove that what they're going to do will work. So in, when you're talking about maybe building programs or the church doing something by faith, the teacher may look at that. The giver will look at it. We'll say, okay, here's what we can do. We can do this, this, and God will do this. The teacher will look at it. We'll do some research. We'll find all the different churches that failed in different giving programs or different building programs. And they can sometimes just be absolutely frozen by fear because they cannot see it working out all of the time. And so they will, they will pull back. Um, they may overlook evangelism. They, they think instruction, knowledge is the most important thing. Somebody else can save them. Um, that they're, they're going to be in charge of teaching them. May ignore, no, no, I looked over one. May depend on their knowledge more than the Holy Spirit. And that is a, that's a big battle for teachers because they have studied, because they have read, because they have delineated, because they have it out. A teacher, a carnal teacher is going to spend more time in research than they will in prayer and asking the Lord to, to show them. May develop insurmountable issues over minute details. They will separate over things that really shouldn't be separated over, but they will say, well, that's it. I'm not going to read this person anymore. And they will, they will find out that Schofield uh, had a certain affinity toward the gap and they will, not the clothing store, the, uh, the, the theological theory of creation, and they will throw Schofield out. Or they will find out that, um, I think independent Baptists are the only ones that are still finding out that Spurgeon's a Calvinist. And they will find that out and then they will say, well, I'm not going to read any more of his stuff. And they'll just, they'll just throw it out instead of realizing, okay, God can teach through many, many different ways. Um, May ignore others because of perceived mistakes in their lives, because they embrace these wrong things, a teacher will tend to turn away from. The next one is the one that most often happens. They, they make the fence the issue. They make the fence the issue. Let me see if I can illustrate that. They will, they will write somebody off for not agreeing with their fence. And what I mean by fence is as, uh, as parents, we put up fences around our children when they're younger to protect them. But we do that in the hopes of we're gonna take time to train them so eventually they won't need the fence, right? So hopefully Chloe right now, wherever she is in Arizona or where is she? Is she Arizona? So hopefully her leaders don't have to have her on a fence or on one of those, remember those leashes that everybody used 15 years ago? And they put their kiddos on a leash. Hopefully Chloe at her age has learned self-control and just can't run around and do whatever. When they were younger, they put the fence. Well. Theologically and practically, we make fences, correct? For instance, um, does the Bible say anywhere that it's wrong for men to go out to eat with ladies other than their wives? No, it doesn't say that. But most of us have put the fence up the same, well, if I, now, unless it's because of a job particular situation where you have to meet somebody or you're eating lunch with a boss or something along those lines, but you're still going to say, okay, this is very, very careful. But making the fence the issue is when we look at that and say, okay, if you do eat with your boss, then you're an adulterer. Do, do you understand? Now, is it wise for a man to go on dates with somebody, not his wife? No. Does the Bible say, thou shalt not date anyone but thy wife? Not specifically, but a, a carnal field teacher will look at the fence and say, okay, that means that they're actually committing the sin. 
So if they're doing, if they're, if they're actually, you know, over that fence or whatever, this means that they don't, and they'll just, they will heap on uh, some of the things there, okay? They make the fence the issue. Next one, they may reject truth if not systematically and correctly presented. In other words, somebody may have good truth, they may be handing out good truth, but it may not be lined up in the way and presented in the way that it needs to be, and they'll just roll their eyes, fold their arms, and just, and not get anything from it. And then lastly, may become more enamored with study than with the Savior, more enamored with truth. They, become in, they can become in love with learning. Now, to some of you, that seems so crazy. You're like, in love with learning. What could be wrong with a person that would do something like that? But a teacher who is gifted with studying and digging things out and learning, they can get, they can get in love with that process, with always wanting to find the new. And sometimes the carnal-filled teacher is the one that you will find that always sees the new thing. That have never been discovered before. Do you remember the Bible code? You can take the Bible and line it up the words, and then you can find out that, you know, the, the Warriors will win the NBA finals and all the different stuff. You guys don't, I don't see a lot of recognition on your faces. The Bible code was a big deal. Do you remember the hidden prophecies in the Psalms? God has hidden prophecies in the Psalms to tell us how many times has a diet been sold as a hidden diet to help us be healthier? And no, it's another marketing scheme. And, and many times these, these, these folks will be absolutely enamored with study, with finding this and finding this, and they'll think they've unlocked. Well, listen, I, I will tell you, I have had, I've had unbelievably detailed discussions about who the giants were, how they originated, and it's really not one of the major points of Scripture. Can we agree on that? Were there giants in Scripture? Yes. yes. Do we know, need to know where they lived, what they ate for lunch, and who their favorite baseball team was? No, but boy, do a teacher that gets off, uh, gets offline, they, they will get into all of that. They'll tell you what their, you know, what their eye color was and, you know, why most of them settled in Red Bank and all the rest of that and different stuff like that. And they will just lay it out and they, they really will. They'll get specific. Now, I'm joking about Red Bank, obviously, but they will say, they'll say, hey, this is what happened. And they get really, really detailed on something that is not important, um, that, that God did not give us the details on. They will argue about the, the, uh, the will worship and, and the different things that God just mentions in God's word. Now, here's some keys. If you're a teacher, I want to encourage you to study the writings of Luke and Ezra, study their life. But here's some things to remember, okay? You, you need to practice creative meditation, you need to practice creative meditation. What is creative meditation? Okay, what does this truth mean for me? God's truth never, ever, ever, ever changes, but it's not enough just to say, okay, this is the truth. What does this truth mean to me? And meditation is thinking out and thinking in. Teachers don't have a hard time thinking out. And what I mean by thinking out is figuring out what God's word is actually saying. Teachers are good at that, but then they stop there. They don't stop and say, okay, what does it mean to me. What does this mean? What is, the what is that practically going to look like in my life? How is that going to affect me as a dad, as a husband, as a wife, as a mom, as a brother, as a sister, as a church member? A teacher will not sit down and say, okay, Lord, now teach me thy way. I know your truths. Teach me your way. It's very, very important. So pra practice creative medica medication. <laughs> Do not practice creative medication. That is a very, very bad thing. I apologize. I have been practicing creative medication this morning. That's why it's difficult for me to know I haven't. But uh, creative meditation, of course, that gets right along with the next point. Don't, don't neglect practical application. And when you are interacting in a group, please interact the entire time. Do not wait till the end. Now, I have been in a situation where a person with the gift of teaching, we got all the way done, we got to the end, and they said, before we vote on this, could I just say one thing? An hour and 15 minutes later, this person laid everything out and completely changed everybody's mind. And I sat there and thought, why have we been discussing this for three weeks? Why didn't you give us this? Because he just held on to it. He held on to it. He's like, well, this is what they came to. Okay. Well, fellas, let me give you some more information. And he laid it out. It was, it was beneficial, but it was also a tad frustrating. So ask the questions all the way along. Ask the questions of your children. Ask the question of your spouse. Don't just wait till they get to the end and then say, let me tell you why that fell apart. That's not really helpful. 
okay? Jump in ahead of time, all right? Um, and, and, and learn to creatively critique and help, don't criticize. Now, if you're a teacher and you're having devotions with your family, make sure and talk. I haven't met two people that have, that have the exact same gifting, but talk to your spouse and see how the teaching is going. Because many times a teacher being enamored with the details, that's not the best thing for a four-year-old or an eight-year-old or a 40-year-old. A lot of them will tend to get glazed over. And so you, you, have, to be, you have to be careful. So learn, to, learn to, to critique yourself. Learn to critique the effectiveness of what you're talking about because you're not just looking for truth. You're looking for truth applied. You're looking to see growth. And then, and here is the, uh, here's the difficult part. Remember that the Bible shows us a God who is after the heart, not just the activity. He does want us to do the right activity, but he wants us to do it from the right heart. Teachers tend to make sure they get the activity done correctly, not necessarily the heart. All right, before we move on, well, it's 10.07. We'll give a couple of minutes here for questions if you have any questions about teaching. The other thing that I would say about teaching is I would strongly consider writing. Because if you, if you have been given the gift of teaching, you probably have a good way of getting it delineated out to where it could be disseminated for others. And I would encourage you to do that. Um, that's hard work. That's difficult. But as you develop the skill of teaching, I believe you will find that to, to be one of the ways that you can be very, very helpful. Any questions about the teacher before we wrap up? Yes, sir. Oh, you can have, there, I, I don't believe you have just one. The question is, do you believe you, you can just be a teacher? Or can you be a good teacher and a good exhorter? I believe you can have a mix of gifts, although I have not seen a good, I will see a, te I have seen teachers that have learned how to exhort and I have seen exhorters that have learned how to teach. But I don't know that, that I've personally ever seen a good teacher exhorter. It's kind of like a good prophet mercy. Usually it's a prophet who's learned that people have emotions and they, they need to think about people, or it's a mercy who has, has learned to, to key in on, on truth normally. But I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't write that down as doctrine. Any other question? Wonderful. Thank you for coming to church. Let's stand. We'll have a word of prayer. Or thank you for coming to Sunday school. That's that creative medication again. Thank you for coming to Sunday school. We will dismiss and head out to church. Lord, thank you for meeting with us this morning. I ask that it would be profitable, helpful, Lord, to the teachers that are in this room, that you would encourage them in their walk with you. Lord, thank you. We love you. In Christ's precious name, amen. Amen. Thank you. See you in a few minutes.